Welcome back. Before I start talking about Python, I'm going to start uh, by talking more generally about algorithms. So let me start with a simple definition. An algorithm is a precise sequence of simple steps to solve a problem. So there's a little bit going on in here, so let me start by just unpacking that for us. So the first important word is precision. The sequence of steps that I'm going to give you to solve a problem have to be precise. So for example, if I gave you a recipe to bake a cake, I wouldn't say make the batter. If I was giving you directions to go to San Francisco, I wouldn't say drive to San Francisco. So there has to be precision in what we do. In a recipe, I wouldn't say put some flour into the big bowl. How much? Uh, in driving directions, I wouldn't say drive on this road. Um, I would say drive this many miles on the road. So we have to be precise when we specify things. Of course, an algorithm, a recipe, driving directions, is a sequence of steps, but those steps also have to be simple. They have to be simple and precise. So for example, with a recipe, it's flour, and then milk, and then butter. So it's not, you, you, each step has to be extremely simple to execute in a well-designed algorithm. And of course, when you put all that together, whether it's a recipe, a driving directions, or a computer code, it of course solves a problem. It bakes a cake, it moves me from point A to point B, it solves a differential equation, whatever it is. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. So this demo works a little bit better when we're actually in a class, but let's try to use our imagination. I'm gonna write an algorithm that counts how many students are in a class. Okay? And you can see here that the algorithm is going to have four steps. And let me start going through what those steps are now. Okay, step one, initialize a counter to zero. So that counter, of course, is gonna be how, who I'm counting in the class, and by the time I get to the, to the end of it, it'll count the total number of people who are sitting in the class. Okay, so precise, simple, nothing complicated there. Okay. Step two. So imagine now we're in a classroom, I'm in the front facing you, you are sitting down facing me, and there's row after row after row of chairs. Okay, stand in front of the first student in the, sorry, stand in front of the student in the first row in the far left. So imagine I'm standing in front of the first student here. There are the unlucky ones in this particular example. Um, and that's a precise and unambiguous and simple uh, step. And add one to your counter. Again, precise, simple, easy to do. So what did I just do? I just counted that student. Okay, good. Last step of the algorithm is slide over to stand in front of the next student in the row or slide up to the next row and then go back to step three. Okay, so I've counted one, I slide over, and I say go to step three. What does step three say to do? Plus one. Good, count one. And then where do I go from there? I go back to step four, of course. Step four, count, go back, to, uh, slide over, go back to step three, count one, I've got three. And, and let's look at the last clause. If you reach the last student in the top row, then stop and report the value. Okay, so let's just think through the algorithm. Zero, one, two, three. Eventually, you get to the end of the row. I go up one row, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and I keep going, winding my way through the class until I get to the very end, count the number of students. Okay. Perfectly simple, precise sequence of steps, not a lot of ambiguity here. I could evaluate this as a person if I wanted to actually do that. Now, we're going to be writing a lot of algorithms and then translating those algorithms into actual code in Python. And there are always, always, always four things you want to think about when you're writing code. Correctness, completeness, efficiency, and implementability. Okay? So let's talk about correctness. So the first thing you always want to ask yourself is, is your algorithm correct? So what do I mean by that? I mean that if your algorithm gives an answer, so in the case of counting, a number comes up at the end, are we sure it's right? Okay, so is it that right answer? So is that the number of students? So an answer comes out. And is that the, the correct answer? Good, that seems like a, like a bare minimum you would want from your algorithm or your program. Is the algorithm complete? And notice this is a little bit different than correctness. Here, it says, does it always find the answer if the answer exists? So this is, have you considered all possible situations? So it's not just that I got an answer and the answer is right, is have you considered all possible situations of what your input looks like? And the counting class is the configuration of the class, how many, you know, where are the students sitting, so on and so forth. Okay, so correctness and completeness are just, are we getting the right answer and are we always getting the right answer when we are, um, when we are running the algorithm? The next one is not so much necessary, but it's more practical um, um, reality of writing algorithms is that, is it efficient? How much time will it take to run 
both in the best case and in the worst case. And we'll be talking a lot about formal mechanisms for doing this later on in the class, but for now we'll sort of think about this loosely. So efficiency, obviously, when you're doing computation, particularly in this world of big data, these massive data sets, is incredibly important. You can have correct, complete, beautiful, elegant algorithms, but if I can't run them efficiently in a reasonable amount of time, it doesn't really do me a lot of good. And then the last step is, can we implement these algorithms on a computer program? Okay, so you can have a correct, a complete, and an efficient algorithm, but it requires you to do something that you can't do on a modern computer. So we always have to ask about, is this implementable? Okay. All right, so let's go back to our counting algorithm and see if it satisfies these constraints. Okay. So here again is my four-step counting the number of students in a classroom. Initialize a counter, stand in front of the first student, add one to the counter, slide over, count, add one, slide over, add one, add, slide over, add one, and so on and so forth. So it seems to be correct. I mean, as long as everybody's sitting in that configuration uh, row, and obviously I skip over empty seats if there are empty seats, I've, there's no people sitting in the aisle, then when I get to the end and I report a number, well, then it seems like that would be the number of people in class, assuming, by the way, nobody came in while I was counting. So let's say I lock the doors when the class starts, okay? So that seems like it's, it's reasonably correct. Let's think about completeness. So again, completeness is, not, completeness is not about do you get the right answer, but have you considered all possible situations um, when you are running your algorithm? So in this case, it's where are the students, what is the, 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 the layout of the class? So there is one, there's probably a few things you can think about here. So just take a second and think about the completeness of this. Have I, have I missed a configuration that may be a problem? So here's one. There's actually a couple of them, but I'm going to just talk about one of them. Um, is what happens, this is by the way my worst nightmare as a professor, is I show up in class and nobody's there. Right? Zero students show up. Okay? So what would happen is, well, step one is fine, but step two I have a problem. Because step two, notice it's assuming something. It's assuming that there's a student in the first row in the far left. And what if there's not? Well, now this algorithm completely breaks down. There's no mechanism for saying, Nobody showed up in class. So let's see if we can fix that. So I've added, you can see here, a step two. So now my algorithm has five steps. So step two says, if there are no students in the class, then, well, the professor sucks, obviously. So stop. Return. The counter is zero. Okay? So this may seem a little pedantic. It may seem a little nitpicky. But one of the things you always have to think about in your algorithms and eventually in your code is, have you considered all the cases? Have you thought about all the different situations of what the input looks like and control of that? And that is very difficult to do um, because you often you know, don't have control over certain aspects of the input. So I just sort of want to make that case here that we've got to think about that completeness. It's not just about I got an answer and it's right, but I've had, have I thought about all the different situations I'm going to be uh, encountering? So I'm going to skip the implementable uh, parts because we're not actually going to try to implement this. But let's talk about efficiency. So let's imagine I have a class of 100 students. Yeah, and I go to the first student and I say, one, two, three. You got to be thinking that the person in the last row in the last seat is like, oh man, I got to wait around for what, a good 10 minutes for this idiot to get his way through the, the course. It doesn't seem very efficient because while I'm counting, everybody is sitting there idle. And notice too is that the counting scales with the number of students. Um, and it scales linearly. If I double the number of students, it will take me twice as long. If there's 10 times more students, it will take me 10 times longer to count the number of students. So maybe in a class of 10 students, I can zip through 10 very easily. But if the class is 1,000 students or 2,000 students, that's not going to be super efficient, right? Now, so that doesn't seem great. But on the other hand, it's not clear what I have to do here. I mean, I've got to count the students. And there are a certain number of bodies, and I've got to count them. And so it's not obvious that I can do any better, right? OK. Well. So do. And again, this is, just, this is just to sort of get you into the mindset of thinking about these issues of correctness, completeness, and efficiency. We're, we're going to be talking about a lot about that, and I want you to have that in your head as we start thinking. So let me come up with a new algorithm that is going to count in parallel. Okay, and again, this works way better in live, uh, so we're going to have to use our imagination. Okay? So let's just start going through the steps. So step one. So imagine I have a class with uh, 100 students, yeah? and I ask everybody to stand up. Okay? Everybody stand up, please, and think of the number 1. Okay? 
So everybody has a single number in their head, one, and that, of course, is their count. They're counting themselves. Okay, step one, precise, simple, unambiguous, no problem. Okay, now, everyone who is standing, find a partner, and I have a conceit here that says if there's an odd number of people, uh, then one person will remain, and that's fine. They don't have to be matched up. Okay, so we have 100 people, everybody matches up. So you reach over and you grab your neighbor and you, and you, you have a partner. Okay, simple, precise, easy to do. Okay. Now, if you have a partner, then decide between the two of you who will sit down. The one who sits, sits should tell the other one who remains standing. Uh, th sorry, the one who sits should tell the one who remains standing the number he or she is thinking. Okay, so 100 people stand up. We all have the number one in our head. I partner up and I, tell, we, I decide you're going to sit down and you tell me your number. So now I have two numbers, one and one. If I'm standing and you were told a number, step four, add it to the number you were thinking and that's now your new number. Okay, so what did I just do? 100 people stand up, everybody's got one. Pair it off, 50 people sit down, 50 people remain. What number does everybody, every num everybody have in their head? Two, right? So what did they do? They, in parallel, counted themselves and, and one person for me. So I've got you all working for me. You're all starting to count, right? So you all know that there's half the people are sitting down. You, they have been counted by virtue of one. Now, step five, if you're the last person standing, report that number that you're thinking. Otherwise, go back to step two. So now we've got 50 people standing. Everybody's got the number two in their head. What do we do? Pair off. Half the people sit down. They pass two back to the person standing up. What number do they have in their head? Four. So now I've got 25 people with four in their heads. What's 25 times four, by the way? 100. That's the count. But that count is distributed among 25 people. So let's go back a little bit. When there was 25 people standing, everybody, sorry, when there were 50 people standing, everybody had the number two. 50 times two is 100. They had the distributed count. Let's go back one more. 100 people are standing, they all have the count of one. 100 times one is one. That count is staying the same, but it was distributed among 100 people, and then 50 people, and then 25 people, and then eventually 12, 6, 3, and eventually down to 1. So I'm counting in parallel, and notice that it's incredibly efficient, and we're going to see in a minute how efficient that is, because I'm not at going along one by one by one. You are all simultaneously counting. When I got 100 of you to stand up and 50 of you to sit down, you did half of my work for me in one step. Okay, so let's think about whether how much more efficient this is. All right, so what's, what, what do I mean by efficiency? I mean, how long does it take? So when I'm counting students sequentially, it takes one beat for every person. So if I have 100 people, I've got to count 100 times. If I've got 200 people, I've got to do 200 times, and so on and so forth. So let's think about that again. So these are going to be the number of students, and these are going to be the number of rounds. How many people stand up, half sit down, Add the number. So let's think about how many rounds. So if there's two people in the class, what's going to happen? Two people stand up. They both have one. Uh, one person sits down. They pass that one over to this person over here. And you got two, and you're done. So there's only one round to be done. Okay, good, trivial. Four people in the class. What's going to happen? Four people stand up. Two people sit down. And then one person sits down. So there's only two rounds there. Okay. So... Okay, good. So let's do it one more time. Now I have eight people. Eight people stand up, half sit down. Four people are left standing. Okay, I just did one round, and, and I know if there's four people standing, there's only two rounds left, so I don't have to go through the exercise. It's simply going to be three rounds. Now notice something really interesting is happening here. I went from two to four to eight. I've doubled. I've doubled the number of students and notice that the number of rounds is only incrementing by one. So let's look at if there was eight students and I was counting sequentially the old-fashioned way, it would have cost me eight. And this would have cost me four and this would have cost me two. It would have scaled linearly. Okay, let's do one more round. So with 16 students, how many rounds? Well, 16 stand up, eight sit down, and I have eight left. Well, that was one round that I just counted. I know that eight students are gonna cost me three rounds, so it's only four rounds. So again, I've doubled from 8 to 16, but it's only cost me one round. Why? Because each round, half of the students sit. So when I double the number of students, it only takes me one more time to get half of them to sit. So of course, with 32, 
it's going to be 5, 64 is going to be 6, 128 is going to be 7. I keep doubling the number of students and the number of rounds is only incrementing by 1. That's beautiful. Because think about here, if I was doing sequentially, I would, it would have cost me 128. Okay? So what is the relationship between the number of rounds and the number of students? Okay. It, of course, is the log. And I know what you're thinking right now, that somewhere in grade school or in junior high school or in high school, I learned log, and I had no idea why I had to learn it. This is why, right here. Logs are really cool, and they're particularly cool in computer science. And we're going to see a lot of these logarithms, because when you can do things in log time, you have this beautifully efficient algorithms. So if I have n students, then I have log n rounds. So that is, the, it, the complexity grows with the logarithm of the number of students, which means it grows very, very, very slowly, because that log does something like this. Okay, we love logarithms when it comes to efficiency. Okay, so what did we do? We talked about in algorithms, correctness, completeness, uh, efficiency, and it can be implemented. Um, I gave you two examples of algorithms, one for counting sequentially and one for counting in parallel, really just to illustrate this issue right here of efficiency and in particular log n. We'll, we'll talk some more about this. If you don't see this exact relationship, don't worry. We'll talk about that in more detail. Okay? So what's next, of course, is can you implement? Okay, so that's the next step. And that is what we're going to start talking about next. So how do you translate an algorithm, an idea for calculating something, into a computer program? And to do that, you need a programming language. You need a language to speak to the computer to. And for us, that's going to be Python. It could have been C, C++, Java, Scheme, ML, Prolog, JavaScript. There's any number of languages we could, we could talk in. We are going to talk in Python, and there's a number of reasons for that I'll talk about as we get started on that. And the important thing here, though, is to, is to always remember that when you go to write code, Python, you have to be thinking first about algorithm. Precise, simple sequence of steps that solve a problem. Is it correct? Is it complete? Is it efficient? And will I eventually be able to turn those instructions into something that I can specify in Python? Okay, uh, that's the end of this lecture. Uh, starting next, we're going to start talking about Python. Okay, so we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.